<laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, the Labour-led government, especially in its 2005 to 2008 term, was concerned to remedy the reputation that New Zealand had developed uh, over many years for its severely under-regulated financial services market. <clears throat> and uh, that determination arose even before some of the finance company failures and the other uh, less than desirable conduct uh, that we've seen in this country from that sector over the last few years. But it was largely motivated by a concern about the stability of our financial companies sector and a general lack of proper consumer protection. Uh, these were some of the symptoms that the legislation promoted uh, by the last Labour-led government targeted. And much of that legislation went through the parliamentary process under the sponsorship of Leanne Dalzell as Minister of Commerce, so it's been good to have heard her contribution on this legislation tonight. Uh, sir, there were three laws of particular note uh, in this category, and all of them had major bi bipartisan support, major party bipartisan support, that is. The first was the Reserve Bank Amendment 2008, uh, which provided for Reserve Bank prudential supervision of non-bank deposit takers rather than simply relying on the trustees uh, of those non-bank deposit takers to exercise necessary oversight. Uh, that's a major uh, clean-up uh, in this sector and it's functioning extremely well as far as anybody can tell. The second <coughs> reform was the Financial Advisors Act 2008 and the third the Financial Service Providers Registration and Dispute Resolution Act 2008. And it's the second and third of those two acts, uh, those three acts that would be amended by the legislation that we're now reading a first time. Uh, Mr Speaker, in 2008 Labor sponsored the Financial Advisors Act to, be able to ensure that financial advisers were subject to tighter rules of professional conduct and competence. The act was just one part, as I've said, of the effort to bolster investor confidence uh, after the, uh, or in anticipation of, in fact, the global credit crunch, uh, and again, in the middle of a string of finance, finance company failures in New Zealand, were authorised to be made under the Act, uh, were required to focus on financial products and not financial decisions, uh, which had been the original proposition in the first draft of the bill uh, circulated for comment. A tiered approach to uh, the regulation of advisers was taken. First, authorised financial advisers uh, were to be allowed to provide advice on complex products, uh, for example securities or futures contracts, the really tricky stuff. Uh, there were to be stringent requirements on those in that first category, as is appropriate. Advisers falling into the second category uh, only faced a basic code of conduct and uh, reasonably minimalist disclosure requirements, uh, but in return for those uh, pretty light-handed uh, regulatory requirements on them, uh, they were permitted only to provide advice on simple products like uh, <coughs> insurance or consumer credit contracts. But even the second tier of advisers uh, was required to be registered and to belong to a dispute resolution scheme, and those were two requirements that had never existed before and really did contribute to the Wild West nature of our financial services regime. <coughs> the legislation enabled the adoption of a qualifying financial entity, QFE, to reduce compliance costs for institutions with large numbers of advisers. Uh, there had been a concern that these institutions would be put to enormous administrative costs if each of those advisers had to register and be subject to the provisions of the Act, so this QFE mechanism was established to effectively provide for group registration. The Securities Commission was the regulatory body empowered to oversee the new rules. The Act established a Commissioner of Financial Advisers uh, to be a specialist member of the Securities Commission and a Code Committee and a Disciplinary Committee. The Financial Service Providers Registration and Dispute Resolution Act in turn established an independent and free dispute resolution service for consumers with problems with financial advisers or service providers. And that act basically set up a co-regulatory model uh, under which industry groups would develop their own schemes which would then be subject to 
uh, approval by the Ministry of Consumer Affairs. The schemes would have to meet certain minimum requirements, such as accessibility, independence, fairness, accountability, efficiency and effectiveness. The Act also established a reserve scheme for providers who didn't belong to any of these uh, particular industry dispute resolution schemes. They would default into the reserve scheme so that no, no customer of a financial service provider would go without the protection of an industry dispute scheme. Uh, sir, the intention of this amendment bill introduced on the 8th of December last year is to make technical amendments to the Financial Advisors Act 2008 and to the Financial Service Providers Registration and Dispute Resolution Act 2008. The amendments largely involve changes to the QFE model that I've just described and that other speakers have mentioned. And there are basically three significant changes that the Act would make. First, a QFE will be required to name individual contractors whose advice it will take responsibility for, instead of automatically being responsible for advice from all of its contractors. Secondly, the changes will allow a QFE's named contractors, as well as its employees, to provide financial advisor services on the QFE's complex products without being individually licensed. And at the moment, under the legislation in its current form, that's permitted only for the QFE's employees as opposed to the contractors uh, that they might retain as well. And thirdly, employees and named contractors of a QFE will be able to provide financial advisor services for products for which the QFE is a promoter under the Securities Act. At the moment, that's only permitted under the Financial Advisors Act if the QFE is actually the issuer as opposed to also the promoter of the product. <clears throat> Those are changes that uh, effectively line calls were made about in the select committee process. I was chair of the Finance and Expenditure Committee when we considered these issues. They are calls that could have gone either way. Uh, frankly, uh, it's probably useful to try uh, the, uh, the changes that are suggested in the legislation. Uh, particularly in light of the prevailing economic climate uh, and to see whether or not they actually will be improvements uh, on the current legislation. Uh, as I say, in select committee, the evidence could have gone either way. So part one of the bill amends the Advisors Act and uh, part two, the uh, Registration and Dispute Resolution Act. Uh, basically, Clause 6 deals with matters of interpretation. Uh, the most notable change there is the uh, amendment to the definition of a nominated representative. A nominated representative will be an individual who's formally nominated by a QFE in accordance with the new Section 68A uh, to perform financial advisor services in respect of the QFE. Clause 8 amends Section 12 of the Act to provide that activities performed by certain classes of person don't amount to financial advisor services. Clause 10 uh, amends section 17 to 19 to make the changes uh, relating to nominated representatives, that is contractors, uh, that I've already uh, referred to, sir. Clause 11 places nominated representatives in the same position as employees. Clause 12 extends the restriction on the term share broker. Uh, and the rest of part one is largely concerned with replacing uh, terms, changing implementation dates and simplifying wording. There's really only one significant change in part two, that's clause 35, it extends the lists of people who are not held to be financial services providers. The two new categories there are those who are nominated representatives under the Financial Advisors Act and employers uh, that offer services to employees to enable them to, enjoy, uh, to join schemes like KiwiSaver and there are some other technical amendments. So there's no regulatory impact statement required for the bill because, uh, according to it, the proposals are minor and machinery in nature. Labor envisages supporting the bill for that reason and because it amends legislation promoted by the former Labor-led government in a way that will hopefully enhance its effect.